Welcome to the Marketing Trail Guide podcast, season one, Opportunities in Crisis. I'm your host, Kevin Krushevich, founder of Marketing Trail Guide and fractional chief marketing officer for companies running on the Entrepreneurial Operating System, or EOS. This is episode three, The Steady Voice of Leadership, and my guest is Charles Antis, CEO of Antis Roofing in Irvine, California. Charles is not only one of the most respected roofing experts in the country, he's also a dynamic business leader, humanitarian, and champion of corporate social responsibility, and he truly walks the talk. I had the chance to sit down with Charles on May 1st of this year, and we talked about how to deal with fear, the critical importance of focusing on your people, and how to survive and thrive as a leader in times of crisis through mindset, attitude, and personal disciplines. I know that you'll get a ton of value out of our conversation. So please sit back and enjoy my interview with Charles Antis. Charles, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I was, I was trying to do that with like driving in reverse with a boat. That was hard to do. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here, Kevin. Thank you. So good to have you. Uh, we got a chance to get to know one another a little bit uh, at the Ronald McDonald House of Orange County, um, where you serve on the board. Um, your bio is, is so long that I, I just can't get to it all, but I'm just going to rapid fire through a couple more things here. You're on the board at uh, the National Roofing Contractors Association, the Alliance for Progress, uh, the Roofing Alliance for Progress, the Orange County Habitat for Humanity, the Ronald McDonald House, as we mentioned, Cal State University Fullerton Center for Leadership Board of Directors, Orange County United Way, and uh, maybe others that aren't even on here. And so why I wanted to invite you onto the podcast was um, because you're such a dynamic um, business leader and um, you're, you're much deeper than just the CEO of Antist. You're so multifaceted. And um, as a leader, you know, you're very vocal, you're very out there in the community. And I think you're providing a lot of leadership and a lot of um, help for, for business owners and the leaders of nonprofits and inspiration uh, in, in challenging times. And, you know, everything we're seeing and hearing right now has, is related to COVID, right? And, uh, and, and how can we ignore it? Uh, but that seems to be the topic of the day. And so we're going to go there a little bit, um, kind of in this season of, of this podcast and, um, kind of hash through some of this, um, you know, it's, it's hit us hard, right. And, and it's going to continue to hit businesses hard, uh, and nonprofits for that matter. And I'm imagining as a CEO of your business, you've had to massively adjust. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about how first within your corporation, um, you guys have had to adjust and what has that been like as a leader? And then what are you seeing in the community through your involvement in nonprofits and otherwise? Wow. Well, there's been a, a, a mass interruption. If you look at it from the 30,000 foot view, if you look at what we're reading and if we look at economists saying what's going to happen, we can't contextualize it. We can't imagine what it's like to live there because we've never lived in it yet. But we are watching a wake occurring of uncertainty. And so, it, yes, it's, it's tough to see that in the nonprofit world. I, as I told you before we started, I, my heart is heavy, I'm wondering how to message things and when to message things. It's, it's, it's a different landscape, just like it is in the for-profit world. My heart is heavy there as well because I have an obligation. I, I, I'm a servant leader and I serve the people that work here and I have all of these community people that, that, that we serve and, and I don't know the answer. So there's a big dose of fear that I have to just admit yeah. right out from the beginning. Yeah. That hits me like it does probably so many CEOs and VPs that are listening to this podcast. It hits me at 3 a.m. and sometimes I just have to accept that and slide into it. And I think that's our body's way, our animal brain's way of adjusting to the moment. And we just have to not mourn that lost sleep and run with it. But in the moment, leadership today for me has been to be that steady voice, to be the ballast on the ship that doesn't allow that 
quick knee-jerk thinking, especially at the price of anyone, especially at the price of our people. So there is a, a rallying cry within the leadership team at Answers Roofing to put the people first and yet to be really, really adaptive so that we can thrive, so we can survive and yes, thrive. If you don't think it, you you'll won't be it. So we are very optimistic at every turn, but we're also very agile. And then there's a lot more we'll dive into, but it's been a journey um, um, to, over the last seven weeks. And I think we're doing well as a team. And I feel like the, the crazy thing is, is we're on this ship and we're going out to sea very far from shore for an unprecedented storm. And I'm looking around and my shipmates are more in alignment than they've ever been. Hmm. So there's positive things occurring around us, whether we're looking at the air or we're looking at some of the games you're playing with your families, but there's some positive things in businesses that are occurring as well. And, and we're, but we're still adapting and we do not know what is going to happen. No one does. Those that think they know are only if lucky, partially right. So the number one investment has to be hang on to your people. So what that means is invest everything in your people and have your people invest all their resources in trying new adaptive things and saying, fail. It's okay to fail, but fail mm -hmm. fast. So uh, I'm going to go nerdy here for a little bit. Um, a scene from um, Lord of the Rings just came to mind uh, where Gandalf is... Uh, uh, trying to calm down a situation where uh, the steward of Gondor is freaking out because the city is under siege and it looks as though all is lost. And you have, you know, crazy flying dragon creatures killing people and the walls are tumbling and, and, and it looks pretty bad. And the steward of Gondor starts flipping out and yelling, run for your lives! Everybody run, every man for himself. And Gandalf, Gandalf comes along and, and basically knocks him on the noggin with his wizard stick, uh, knocks him out, and he quiets that voice. And he says, man your posts. Uh, and so that came to mind, that uh, scene came to mind as you were describing the necessity of leadership to be a steady voice in that storm, in the midst of chaos. I'm just wondering, and I think it may be beneficial for our audience of business owners and entrepreneurs to hear from you, a seasoned business owner um, and, and, uh, and, and philanthropist. Uh, what are you doing to get your mindset where it needs to be to have that confidence? Like, get specific. Like, what are your disciplines? You know, how do you stay positive as a leader? Um, where do you go for inspiration? Maybe you could talk about that a little bit so that when you step in the office and the your people are looking to you. You have that leader example and, and reaction game day. So that's an interesting, I, I'm not such a geek for Lord of the Rings, but I do remember the actor and I do remember Gandalf. And so I will say it, it is my job to study, to be steady in the storm. <laughs> uh, an old, um, Another actor, a James Bond, Bond, James Bond. Yeah, there you go. That's, you got the, the Connery going there. Not do that. <laughs> uh, that. That is my job. My job, like that actor's job, and I'm not acting, but my job is to not show my fear. What if, you know, if, if, if I don't check off my fear and find a way to, to find my aliveness in me, then I'm gonna wear my fear. And I'm not saying I don't wear my fear. All my people have seen it. You know, those days that I'm smiling and asking somebody why they're doing it that way when I'm the seagull boss flapping my wings and shitting all over people, pardon the expression, but that's, that's my fear, but, but I can't do that. So one of the things that um, I've learned to be is very selfish with my mornings. And so this morning was no exception. I got up a little earlier than I intended to. I got up before four. But that's very, very common for me. Um, and I, I got up and I did some stuff that would center me. And, and it's not the stuff that I grew up with. It's stuff that I've learned from business leaders around the world over the last few years that I just sort of share with. So I'm going to give you some examples. Actually, I have, it's so funny I have this right here. This is one of the most important tools 
that I recommend anyone to get. I've given away a thousand. And in fact, this is so funny. I have this. I've done some other podcasts here. This is like my our our, our conference center is becoming our, my new studio. So, for people listening, not watching, what is the name of that? Five minute journal. Okay. And the five minute journal is a life changer for anyone, hmm. and it only takes five minutes a day, and it doesn't require any belief in anything. It's just you. And all you do is the first thing you do when you get up. Or the first thing I did this morning when I got up was I wrote. Three things I'm grateful for, three things that would make the day great, and two IMs. Mm. Boom. That's it. And if you do that, somebody told me it would change my life about four years ago. A guy named Tony DeCostanza from BookPal gave me one. He said, this will change your life. He's a local here in Orange County. Well, he, he, might, he didn't say it changed my life. He said, try this. It's free. You're, mm. you're a Vistage mate. Um, I found it was life changing and I've given it to a bunch of people. So the reason you do that is it causes this thing to occur. So in the morning, and I'm going to use West Coast weird words, I sort of manifest out my day. Thoughts become words, become actions, become things that are done. If you don't see it or think it, it's impossible that you trip on it. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds too simple, but it's not. So write down what the, the magic is. The magic is section two here. The magic is section two. I, uh, what would make today great? Mm -hmm. I write down this morning. I knew I was going to be on your podcast, Kevin. So I said that I'm going to lift everyone that listens in wakes and in ripples that will last forever. Now that sounds really ambitious, right? Like, who am I to say that I'm going to say something so profound that it's going to stir somebody up and cause him to spin or her to spin and grow and see themselves higher than they ever did before and awaken something powerful in a way that they were never acknowledged? Who am I to say that? But if I don't say it, how's that ever possible? Mm -hmm. So it's a uniquely positive promotional mindset that, that I, I live with. And, and it starts with that five minute journal. Then I do some meditation in whatever way. I mean, I sort of have this thing where I stand next to trees. Now that sounds really bizarre, but sometimes I can feel the aliveness in a tree or in a spot in the space. And on the days that I can feel the aliveness in a tree or in nature, then I feel the aliveness in me. Mm -hmm. And today I feel that aliveness because I started my day that way. So. I'm glad you asked that because I think it's a very important thing because it's so counterintuitive to put the oxygen mask on you before yeah. you do your children. But I do that every day. And so when I come to work every day, yesterday I got up hardly any sleep. I woke up really early. I was concerned about something at work and I had a great day because mm -hmm. I started my day right. And that made all the difference. So it, that, is, that is a critical part of what I do um, to be okay and to occur to my stakeholders in a way that's going to lift them and not nudge them away. Yeah, I think that's so um, practical and so necessary and so easy to miss. I mean, it's not um, it's not utterly profound, and so you might think that oh, I you know it's I could skip this and it's no big deal. Um, but I think uh, I, I'm also in a similar habit. Um, which includes gratefulness, which includes intention, um, which includes, you know, kind of what are the priorities for the day. And when I skip that, I feel a bit, you used a boat analogy, a ship analogy, I, bit, I feel a bit like a ship being tossed by the waves throughout my day. I don't feel centered or rooted. And, um, you know, Charles, that's so practical and helpful for normal times, but now in COVID land, uh, how much more important for leaders who need to inspire other people, lead other people, be productive, and get stuff done with challenges that we've never faced before. Agreed. Um, so we know that there's fallout. We know that there is our challenges. Um, do you have any thoughts about, you know, maybe what some of these permanent sh uh, shifts that are taking place, whether they're going to be permanent or temporary? Like, do you, do you have any predictions um, and, and kind of tied to that? What are the way what are the opportunities that are out there in some of this shift that's going on right now? Um, it's it's easy to look at the negative. It's easy to, to look at the, the things that are happening that are 
hard to deal with, hard to cope with and things that we have to mourn. But in order to move forward, we have to have a vision for something that's possible that's not there yet. Um, are you identifying any of those in, in your industry or in general for businesses uh, that you can share with us? I think the, the structure of what you're saying, the, the, the concept we are building, the concept is we have to push, experiment, try, adapt. So, so I can talk to it. So what's emerging? What's the answer? What's it going to be like? Mm -mm, don't know. Yeah. We have some things that are working really well. We could talk about a few individual things, but we don't know that we don't think we're anywhere near. We're in a new normal right now, but the new, new normal isn't going to look like it looks today, right. nor will it look like how it looked last year year. Um, does that mean I know what it will look like? No, it's really clear to me that nobody knows what it will look and feel like, how deep the economic impact will be, whether or not the Fed can bank everything that they're banking, whether or not a loaf of bread is going to cost $3 or $30. Those are the things that nobody knows. And I'm not, I don't sweat on that. I, mm -hmm. I can't. It's not my job. I'd be, it would be a waste of my energy and resources. So I focus where we can focus. And, and so I know some things. There's a really profound principle here. Uh, adapting. We've, we've known that things are adapting exponentially faster without this kicker. Now we have this kicker. I mean, I read an article I've been waiting to read. I don't know, not that I want it to occur, but I knew this was going to happen. And institutions are just have no way to support themselves. Small colleges, liberal arts colleges are closing their doors forever now. And there's a trend. There's, there's just so many things that are happening. So I, I think it's so critical that, that one thing that we know, with everything changing more than it's ever changed ever in our lives at an exponential pace with a super uncertainty in the economy we know that it's got to be about our people because look at it like this if you lose your people how do you adapt with people that don't know you so the one thing that i can see that's clear is if we want to be adaptive we have to teach an adaptive mindset allow r d money even though it feels wrong now to allow it and we have to invest in our people. So whatever I invested in my people before, I feel like I have to invest more now mm. because if I can keep my people, I can be super adaptive. I'll give you a stat that, that's relative to my industry. I'm on the board, so I get to hear the National Board of Roofing, uh, National Roofing Contract Association. I get to hear some stuff that hits me profoundly because these people, the, we, we, we wear this hard and, and it hurts. Like, this is a tough stat. Three out of five businesses in the roofing industry will fail. Uh, that was before COVID. Three out of five every three years will go out of business. Wow. This is another one. Pre-COVID, 54% attrition rate from the companies, mm -hmm. company to company or leaving. 54% leave the average roofing company every year. Well, how can you put on a good roof if that's the case? Employees, mean you mean? Employees, yes. Okay. You, so if, if, I'm, if I have 100 employees, and I have a roofing company, and every year, uh, 54 of them are new, yeah. how can I put down a, a product that's gonna last 30 years? And especially, how can I adapt right now when systems are gonna change so fast? And so, investment in your employees is critical. Speaking of the roofing industry, um, you know, th that is a, what is, okay, you wanna talk about the future of the roofing industry. I have no idea on technology. It's mass, the technology explosion in roofing right now, and it's good for our trade. But that three out of five, let's do that. That's six out of 10 right now, pre-COVID, let's call it six months ago, we knew that six out of 10 roofing companies were gonna go out of business within the next three years. How is that not going higher? So I'm not judging my industry that I love that's getting stronger, but because of this, if we're not adaptive in our companies, that number has to go up. And so is it gonna be eight out of 10 or nine out of 10? So in my own industry, and in my industry, is, is a good, it's a good industry. We're in a good spot right now because we sell roofs. It's one of those basic needs, shelter. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're in a good spot where we're not competing with champagne as much as we used to be. I don't know what that means, but you know what I mean. Sure. With frivolous spending. Yeah. We're competing for, with, with what, what, what needs. So we're in, a, we're in a good spot in a sense comparatively. And yeah. yet 
I expect the fail rate, if you were a, an, an actuary, 100% you would tell me that's going to go up. That sure. fail rate is going to go up. So there's, there's some glimpses we have in the future. And the answer is put everything in your people and be super adaptive and tune in. Show up, show up, show up. Right now, look, at I'm, I'm in podcast. I'm, on, I'm probably on five different Zoom meetings today, just like you. Yeah. It's show up. You know, yeah. that's the number one rule of awesomeness. And I don't know, I think I learned this from my dad. I definitely learned it from my dad. You show up no matter what. Yeah. This is the time for you to show up. Yeah. And per your earlier comment about mindset, the disciplines you go through, um, adding to just showing up, it's how you show up. Um, another way I've had it put to me is how you sort of presence yourself. You know, how are people experiencing you? And so much of that centered that you described earlier is, okay, I'm present, but what kind of presence is that? And I think those two things go hand in hand. Uh, you know, the comment about people. Vulnerability. The vulnerability piece is, is a hard one to crack hmm. because to be really vulnerable at work, some people will, will they, it's, they don't mean to, I don't take it personally. Some people are like, oh, he's soft, <laughs> you know, though. But, yeah. but what you learn is it's okay you learn is, is I'm way better off being honest and saying, I don't know, than that old style of do it this way, blah, blah, blah. You know? yeah. and, and there's something about in this new world, people crave it. You, it, because if I'm vulnerable right now and I say, I don't know, but I'm committed to do this in this time that we need to over communicate inside and outside our companies, that vulnerability of, of myself and of Susan DeGrassi and of Aaron Antis and of Audrey Schneider, our executive team, that's what allows us to be believed and trusted. And that's what allows us to steer and do really well against the competition. Not that I'm, I don't see it that way. Do really well along with others that do well in the roofing industry. You know, and, and I'm, I'm proud of our team and I'm proud of us all the way down for placing it that way. Yep. So uh, I think there there's has to be some kind of balance or boundary. So you got, we talked about a couple things. We talked about fear earlier. Uh, in the conversation and how we can't as leaders um, inspire fear. We have to inspire confidence. And yet, on the other hand, what I hear you saying is that there is a vulnerability um, and maybe more so, for instance, on your leadership team where you get to voice some of that fear and, okay, how do we deal with that fear versus allowing everybody in, in you know, mid-management or rank and file to be privy to that because that's probably not as appropriate. So how do you strike the balance between that? And then we, just, we'll, we finished talking about people. I want to talk about that adaptive investment, investment in being adaptive um, next, but go ahead and answer that. Or, or what are your thoughts on that, that balance between fear and, and authenticity or, or, um, vulnerability. Well, there is, there is something I was doing a podcast a few weeks ago and I said something um, that was authentic and scary to say, I didn't want to say this, but I knew I had to say it because it was true and I knew it would scare people. And I knew some of my employees would be listening, but I said, um, we're hundred percent invested in our people first. However, in my opinion, a year from now, our company is going to look a lot different. And so I, I wasn't, there was no people carving in my in my mind, it's more using technology like we are right now and, and what, what's gonna rise to the top, but people rise to the top as well. And I think, uh, so there's, I think that, that that is, I have to talk about the fear and, and I have to expect that they're having fear. Some people are reacting poorly everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and I've, I have some really wise VPs that remind us that that's because they're going through something that they've never seen before. And that's because their home life may not be the same as yours and all these things like, Oh, Oh, you know? And so, and I think that, uh, that f I have to be fearful too and show a little bit of it. Cause that's part yeah. of my vul vulnerability. Uh, but I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but there is there, you There's have to strike effort. the conversation. You have to invite the conversation. The other thing that we do is we send out, in, in this over communication period, we, I tell my leaders to over communicate it inside and out. But I, 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 I ask, we ask them, Hey, what's wrong? Are you scared? Yeah. You know, and I say it like that, like I'm talking to a kid, but mm -hmm. if, if this was a written script, there's a big difference in how that, and that's, that's how we deliver it to them. Like, Hey, are you okay? What do you need? We're not judging. What do you need? Yeah, let's get real. I think part of that is just let's have it. Let's be honest um, and 
because if you don't if you don't know what's happening if people aren't honest with you or they don't feel the freedom to to speak honestly to open up they're dealing with something silently they're suffering in silence um and and you're actually not suffering going on right now yeah. and there's a cool thing though when you study the storm when you study the ship and your first mate and second mate are all in alignment mm -hmm. uh what happens after a few weeks is these people that were skittish all of a sudden start to have greater appreciation and they realize they start to believe you because you know i don't blame people for not believing me for a while i don't some people won't believe me my whole life and i that's not my issue i can't worry about that but but it makes me feel so good right now that our culture is growing because those people see the the walk behind the talk it's scary to say something like we are going to err on the side of generosity with all of our stakeholders we've been saying that for three years it scares me to say that yet yeah. i say it boldly because i want you to hold me to that standard because that's the only way i think that we can survive and thrive in this new world and i was saying this sort of before covid mm. crazy ad adaption going on right now and what we talked about earlier that lack of authenticity out there no matter yeah. where you sit there's a lot of lack of authenticity there's plenty of that to point around wow this matters right now to put people first and by the way if you want your brand to be noticed mm. you better matter in your community and that's why you know we know why we exist to keep families safe and dry and that's why we end up donating so much roofing yeah. it, it really defines who we are it's good stuff we're going to take a quick break and uh we're going to come back and i want to get into a little more of this adaptive idea and being invested in being adaptable so we'll be right back From a very young age, I remember in sixth grade being taught in sex education that an abortion is just a woman's choice, and that's it. That's the only thing they teach you. It's not a baby. It's part of the woman's body, and she gets to decide whether it lives or dies. I grew up in Springfield, Massachusetts, in a very Catholic and supportive family. My husband and I, Jerry, have five children. Veronica is the youngest. And I always told her, I know God has great plans for you. And I had always told her that. In high school, and even junior high, she had lots of struggles with anxiety and depression and problems in school. I would just not want to get out of bed. I had no motivation to do schoolwork or be around family or friends. I kind of secluded myself in my room. It was Christmas Day of 2018. I was 16 years old. My boyfriend was 18 at the time. We had been dating for about four months. I felt that something was off with me, so I looked up some symptoms online and it was matching up with pregnancy. I went to the store to get the pregnancy tests, we went home, I took one, and almost immediately the second line came up, which means that you're pregnant. I was just in disbelief at first. I was like, no way, I'm not pregnant, not me. A couple hours later, I took another one and also was positive. I have a very close relationship with my mother, so I decided to tell her first. I went up to her and I showed her the tests and she had already had a feeling that I was pregnant because I was acting differently than I usually do. I was a little bit shocked, but I knew that I would support her. You definitely have always been pro-life and I knew without a doubt, I would never want Veronica to have an abortion. My boyfriend told me he wanted me to have an abortion. His first reaction was just that he was very afraid. I understood where he was coming from because I was afraid as well. I knew that he wanted me to have an abortion and I felt pressured to do so just because I didn't want to ruin his life or alter his life in a big way when it's not something that he wanted. I actually went down to Planned Parenthood. I was put in a room with this woman and instead of her talking to me about my options or resources or different ways I could get help, it felt like she was a salesperson and she was trying to sell me on abortion. That just didn't sit right with me and I knew that that wasn't the place I needed to be and that's when I went home and did my own research. I searched on YouTube what is an abortion and I came across live actions video where the doctor describes in detail at each stage of pregnancy how the baby is killed. I just felt so upset and sad after I saw that video, I just cried. I knew if I hadn't found that video, that might have been my son who was being described in the abortion procedures and I might have gone through with something without knowing what I was truly doing. I knew that he was a person and that he was alive and that killing him at any stage of life would be wrong. 
the truth is powerful. And I'm so glad she came across that. My boyfriend saw that video also, and it moved us both, and we knew that we couldn't do that. My baby was over nine pounds, so I had to have a C-section. They brought me in, and it was about a 30-minute process. The moment I heard him cry, I was just like, I couldn't believe it, and I was so emotional because it felt like it was a blessing that he was there and I could have almost taken his life away. And I was just so, so happy to hear his voice. That's a moment I'll never forget, and I just feel blessed to be his mom. I think a lot of women do choose abortion because they're afraid of the lack of support, and also I think they're just uneducated and not completely aware of what they're doing. Your pregnancy isn't just a blob of cells. It is a human being, and it deserves to live. Don't be afraid. There are so many resources out there that can help you if you are pregnant. I had my boyfriend there with me. He's been a great dad. He's really stepped up. I've been helped by people who I didn't even know existed. I'm really thankful that I found that video and that I found the resources I did and that I have my son. He really saved my life. Well, welcome back to the show. Uh, my guest today is Charles Antis, and we've been talking about mindset. We've been talking about people. Uh, we've been talking about continuing to invest in people. And uh, Charles, you know, one of the things that you mentioned is the, the ability to adapt, the ability to invest in being adaptive. And during the break, uh, I mentioned just kind of a short story about a conversation I had with uh, the CEO of a startup yesterday where um, he's really facing a conundrum right now um, because their go-to-market strategy has been to the in institutional education, which is suffering like you had mentioned, um, all of their clients are shut down. And so they're considering, um, do we go to a B2C play? Do we go directly to consumers? Um, what happens if we pivot to that and in three months everything comes back to normal? What do we do with our people? How do we shift? Do we just experiment over here? Or do we actually pivot the ship? And those are all decisions that owners are having to make right now, especially in uh, a startup environment where, you know, you've got investors that are waiting for their ROI. And, uh, and of course, managing cash and cash flow is uh, an issue for all businesses. I wonder if you can kind of speak to uh, some of your thoughts around adapting, maybe even um, trying things, experimenting with things that you've never experimented before in order to adapt. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I have some recent uh, stories that would kind of outline how I feel. And I think that it supports what I've already said about that need to push investment right now, even though there's fear. Uh, I, I think pivoting is a question every company should ask itself right now, whether they're full flush or not. So I mentioned earlier that I'm, I'm really into trees and I'm really into nature. My family and I are really into nature. I won't, I won't tell you all the stuff that we do, but we love the trees that are in our yard and, and uh, by our spa, a little jacuzzi, we have um, an uh, avocado tree. And this avocado tree is like the only fruit producing tree on our property that produces, I mean, it can produce a lot of avocados and they're good. And then we love that tree, but it's, it's done really well in 10 years. It's only been there like 10 years. It's probably a 15, 20 year old tree. And, but we've had to cut it and it fights for sunlight, right? So this avocado tree that we love, uh, we suddenly noticed that some leaves were falling off and we were concerned. And then we saw this huge rain come. We had this big rain a few weeks ago and more leaves fell off and we wondered, is the olive tree, I'm sorry, the avocado tree okay? And then it pushed flowers everywhere. It made blooms in every nook and cranny, literally every twig held a flower. I'd never seen that before. And I thought, well, that's, that something's off. It's like, it's, it's like going to seed, like if it was an onion or something. And so I was feeling bad for the tree and I was in the spa on Sunday and I was cleaning out these flowers and I was dis disappointing. Like, oh man, it just like wasted all its resources. All of these flowers are falling off because that was, I was wrong. Because right after I said, all of the flowers are falling off, I looked up to confirm and through the sunlight, I saw that all of the flowers were not falling off, only those that were in the shade. 
and everywhere where there was any sun on it that day had a flower that was on its way to turning into fruit. And it, it really hit me profoundly because it reminded me of my own fears and my company. This tree took this rush of water and took an, an, ordin an ordinary amount of its energy. Instead of producing, keeping those old leaves happy, it went out and said, I'm going to try something everywhere. I'm going to try this. I'm going to try that. I'm going to try that. I'm spending a lot of money trying a lot of things. I know most of them are going to fail, but the ones that hit will produce fruit in the summer, will produce, bring returns in the future. And that avocado tree really hit me. And let me tell you my role. And I'm not saying I'm the tree. I don't want to go that far. But the other thing that hit me after I told that story a couple of times, I told it internally, it hit me that my job as that tree is to let those flowers fail, let them fall off, whether it's the old way or the new way, and to invest in what's working as I invest in my people and my company. And so that, that was a really powerful story. I'm going to tell you another spa story that gives you the same, uh, that's just, it's weird that I have two spa stories. It's, I don't understand why this happened, but Nick is my pool guy. Nick's worked for me for about less than a year. He took over the account. I didn't know Nick that well. Honestly, Nick would always show up around dinner time. It was always awkward talking to him. I didn't have a thing to do with Nick, really. It was my wife's relationship. And then about a month ago, during the height and the fear of the COVID, when, when it really felt like we were going to be like the next New York right here, I look out at 6 o'clock and Nick's back in the spa. It made me a little bit uncomfortable. I walked out in the patio about 20 feet away, and Nick didn't even open his stare at me. He didn't look at me straight on. He looked at me on the side, and it felt right for the time. And he said, hey, Charles, how you doing? I said, I'm doing good, Nick. How are you? I wanted to ask him... <laughs> You know, is this an essential service? That's what I was going to ask him. But instead, he said, I, I, I brought something for you. I said, what's that? He goes, I brought you an inner tube and a ball for Charlie and Gracie, your five-year-old twins, because I was thinking what it must be like for them not being around their friends. Oh. You know, I was like, I get emotional telling the story because I got the greatest spa guy in the world. Let's talk about a marketing spend here. Mm. This is a marketing spend. This guy said, I'm going to go on my route and I'm going to think about my people and I'm going to do something. I'm not doing less because there's less. i am probably lost a couple on my route, but I'm going, to, I'm going to dig down and find a way to bring them something of value. Yeah. And that was such a powerful moment. It hit me so profoundly that I was able to take that back to my marketing team and we've created our own beach ball and inner tube. And it's basically a, a gift certificate that they can donate to the cause that will lift them and the things that they love. And we're, and we're sending that to every home we do a repair on, and that, that's in the thousands. And so I love that, that I'm getting that, and I love it that I'm living it, but I'm also seeing the proof of concept all the way around. You know, this has been around for a long time. Companies like Disney and Apple, they invest in all sorts of things that fail, and their futures, and they have future strategies for, for just something dealing with this. And when I was, uh, uh, I was close to the, I'm, I'm close to the CEO of Spec Products. Well, he's since sold the company, and they made more uh, cases for Apple products than Apple did, and I don't know if they still do. But he taught me the way Apple did marketing, and Antis has learned from this. You don't just develop your content inside your company. You go on these like 99 designs, and you have 10, 20 people around the world. Even Apple would hire these people for $99. Try this, try that, try this, try yeah. that, knowing that they're going to parking lot 95% of it, but that's where they get their starts. Yeah. And so they, they, they ended up trying something new. And that's my point. I need to and push my people and I need and even my leaders are not going to be comfortable I know that I'm going to be the one that has to push them yeah. it's okay to spend if we're trying something new so in technology you know right now I, I have a new light that's lighting my face you know why because this is going to make me a tiny bit more noticeable it might give me one percent more um, mm -hmm. of believability and and that might help uh, some nonprofit get it or it might help my company sell one more roof and that might be what it takes that, that leaves this one employee happy where I could invest in him and send him to college or whatever that is so everything yeah. matters invest in everything and enjoy rejoice in failing hey 
yeah. look what I did. It didn't work. Oh, that's so <laughs> look what we learned. The problem is when things work, we don't know what we don't know why. But when yeah. things don't work, we can fail fast. So and create an adaptable, fail fast environment. Yeah. Then I think we have a chance to thrive. Well, your your face and skin look radiant. I didn't mention that earlier, uh, but um, uh, and I don't think it's because of the light. Uh, there's there's life in you that that uh, I think our viewers and listeners can can see. Um, uh, there's your there's your video. You came back. Um, no worries. Um, so a couple things come to mind as you're talking. Um, I think startups understand this paradigm of failing fast. They understand kind of this lean startup model of let's create a minimum viable product and MVP, right? Um, let's put it out to market. Um, let's test it. Let's measure it. And then we're going to iterate, right? And so kind of this, this cycle that goes over and over and over and over. And I think startups get that and, and you know, whether they're um, friends and family backed or they're VC backed uh, or angel backed or whatever it is, they have their, their feet are being held to the fire, from an investor standpoint of like, okay, how are you doing? And where are you in this search for product market fit? Companies that have been around a while, um, maybe they even started with that paradigm, but um, they've been riding a wave for a while and it's been working. And so they haven't had to have that skunks works mentality. Um, so what I hear you saying is that it, to some extent, and maybe in some way, um, even established companies right now need to be thinking startup mode, skunks works mode. We need to test A, B, C, D, and E. And the other analogy that came to mind, I'm not much of a surfer myself, but having you know been born and raised in Orange County, I've gotten on a surfboard and, and realized you know how, how difficult it really is. But when you catch a wave on a surfboard, it's not because you're paddling your arms off. It's because you're at the right place at the right time and you put the right amount of effort in and you have the right amount of balance, but the wave actually does most of the work. And so if it's breaking here and that's where things are working for a while, you can get really comfortable paddling out to that same spot on the break and catching the waves with the same amount of effort. But what happens when they build a jetty, you know, when Dana Point, when Killer Dana turned, you know, it was no longer Killer Dana and they put the jetty in and now all of a sudden the break's gone or it's in a different spot. Um, now you got to start testing is can I catch a wave over here? Can I catch a wave over there? Because if you keep trying to paddle and catch the break at the same spot, you're going to run out of runway, run out of speed, run out of energy, run out of arm strength. It's going to fail because it's there's too much work there. There's a sweet spot somewhere where you got to find. It. And that that's kind of what came to mind as you began to describe both analogies. And I thought they were both really beautiful in in different ways. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I think you're you're right on. It's it's a different. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know where I'd do to go with that. I, I would just say the same thing again. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, cool. Um, I, could you share with us anything that you're trying that's different? Um, I mean, you, you mentioned the, the one, you know, you're giving gift cards or, or, or the, not gift cards, but the ability for people to, on behalf of a nonprofit, donate. Um, you know, and I look at your brand and I think your brand is, is interesting because you're keeping families safe and dry. Um, and that certainly includes roofs, right? But I think you're doing more than just roofing, if, if we're honest. Your brand proposition is broad enough to be inclusive of this overall mission to keep families safe and dry. And if it's in some future date, roofs no longer become necessary, like we just don't need them, which you know I can't imagine that future. But let's just say that product category goes away. You actually have a mission that drives you that's broader than just the thing that we make don't you? And I think that that really drives your mentality too. I do. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, all of us, I always say my dad raised me to do the right in the moment, you know, I always do the right thing, whether it was painful or not. And I saw him do a lot of the right thing painfully. In fact, I think maybe I even associated doing the right thing with pain uh, growing up accidentally, you know, mm -hmm. but I don't know. I think, um, I think when you look around as a business owner, um, there's an opportunity. You know, I, I, I've told myself I'm never gonna bring up this analogy, but I might as well try, because it, it, it might sound so silly or fake. Um, but there's a play that I don't wanna talk about, because I'll probably start crying, and it's Jean Valjean. Well, what's uh, Les Mis, Les, Mis. Les Miserables. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful play, because first of all, there's this amazing, 
um, demonstration of forgiveness in it. Um, I did something horrible, which I've done. I've done horrible things, at least I thought in my mind at the time. And so Jean Valjean does something horrible. This pre he steals from a, a church and the priest who could now put him back to prison forever when he's discovered that he's taken, <laughs> when he's taken the candlesticks um, and, and I can't remember the, the cop's name that's going to put him in prison. This priest said, Jean Valjean, you forgot the silverware and gave him that. You know, when I, when, I, when I see that compassion, you know, I was terrible. Whenever I went to see that play, I would just start bawling through it. That's the first part. That's the setup. I think that we've had that grace in our lives or that, that peace, that ability, that some self-actualization where you don't beat the crud out of yourself anymore. I think to, to have that is the first thing that's so important. But then there's something about a business owner. And this is not just Jean Valjean that I'm going to describe. The logging camps where my grandpa worked in Oregon, um, those businesses took care of the families. I don't know if they were all moral businesses. I don't, but they, they had a mission. If they were going to attract that talent, they had to take care of their families. And, and you look at that Les Miserables story and how Jean Valjean, when he built that factory, man, he was all in for his people. It wasn't just a job. If they needed food, if they needed shelter, there's a level of love that, that we've lost in the West chasing that dollar. Mm. And, and I think that we can have it all. And that's really what I strive to do. And, and I don't want to compare myself to Jean Valjean. That's just silly. But I'm really grateful for that writer, Hugo, I believe, that wrote such a beautiful story that could get through to me in my old way of thinking how grace really looks, how love really looks, and why I used to protect, I used to see myself, and I'm, we're all prejudiced, by the way, in some ways, we can't help it, you know, but, but I used to protect myself in ways that I don't protect myself anymore. I used to have to assign myself in ways I don't assign myself anymore. And now I literally feel like I'm one with everyone. I don't feel better then, but I don't, and I, I know I've worked hard for what I have, but I really believe it's my job to build the way all the way to my employees. And if I want to be successful today, it's also my job to build the bridge all the way to everyone in the community, no matter what. Even those that might say, I don't want your help, Charles. Yeah. I need to just be steady and say, you may, and I'm still going to do this. You don't have to say thank you. But this is, I'm doing this because I don't know why it works. I don't, you know, I said I don't like to talk about religion and stuff. I really don't. I'm very comfortable not understanding how and why all this works. But man, I am blessed. We are blessed. I have never been happy like I can be today, nor was I ever such an awesome version of myself. I don't compare myself to you anymore, Kevin. I would have if I'd met you 10 years ago. God, God damn, his arms are bigger than mine. You know, I'd be, you know, I mean, I would be starting to, and now I just, you know, I just, I hope he's, I hope he's going, I hope he's happy. Yeah. And, you know, and I, and I believe you are. And that's what I want for myself. I want to be happy. So if I can live like this, kind of that Jean Valjean essence of how to run a business, I know I'll be around and I know I'll be able to take care of my family and those families within my company as they take care of those families. You look at the demographic of those people that work in the construction industry, mostly immigrant Latinos, and they have a Talk about generosity. I've never met um, a Latin born worker that doesn't send money to his aunts, his uncles, his grandmas. And you know, it's like a, a sense of generosity to family. Well, that, that, that's how we feel here at Antis Roofing. And, and I believe that that's going to make us relevant for a long period of time. I believe that our ship will come back in and we'll be even more straight coursed than we are today. Well, I think we'll leave it there, Charles. Um, I, I think I, I just want to thank you for, um, you know, the example that you're setting, um, the inspiration that you are not only in this podcast, but who you are in the community. Um, one of the words we talked about offline was authenticity. We talked about this idea of humility and, um, 
I just see that in you and I want to affirm that. And that's not lip service and, and that's not me, you know, just flattering you. So I just want to thank you for that. Um, you know, you are a, you are a city on a hill uh, and your light, your light is shining. Uh, and so grateful for you. Uh, thank you for your time. It's very valuable. And thank you for blessing thank you. our audience. Thank you for working with us at Ronald McDonald House. That exercise is we're trying to learn to be more creative that creative, you know, and by the way, we, we, we can only do some so fast, but thank you for your spirit and also the way that you've magnified what we're trying to do in doubling the size of the house there. We, and, and I will plug that since I brought it up. Yeah. Um, I'm the chair of the, well, along with Katie Rucker of the Capital Campaign to double the love, double the house. We pre-COVID had raised almost 9 million of the 12 million that we are going to raise right now. We are, we are, we are checking on all of our donors and how they're doing, but we are very much um, in need to double the house so that we can keep those chalk families close mm -hmm. so that their kids can heal. Absolutely. Thank you for that plug. And if, um, if our listeners and, and those that are viewing uh, want to learn more about Antis or about the Ronald McDonald house, how can they do that? Um, well, I would invite everyone, if you have, if you're kind of like intentional, purposeful, or you want, you're curious about that, you should follow me on LinkedIn. I haven't done a ton of posts this week, but almost every week I post at least a 10 or dozen times. And I'll post about how you can do it. Like the blood drives, we're having blood drives at Antis campus here. We're having a super drive, two of them next month, where we're going to be able to probably affect over 300 people with donations. And, and this is the cool thing about staying connected to companies like Antis. I have I mean, my board members like, or my VP, Susan DeGrassi, who's on the American Red Cross board and on the National Women in Roofing Board. You know, we, our involvement keeps our ears open and we stay in touch with Disney, with Edwards, with Pimco, all these other brands that are doing stuff and we share ideas and we share functions. And if you stay, if you follow us, you will be able to, First of all, get involved, but also I think that if you follow us, you're going to stay innovative in brand. You're going to stay innovative in how you talk about your business because we're going to adapt and we're going to be talking about it. One thing everyone knows me is, is Charles is going to, I scare some people because I'm going to tell the truth. And, and I think that um, right now I have a team that really appreciates that. And, you know, it's, it's, it's perfect. And I'm going to tell the truth. So I'm going to keep going on. I'm going to tell you what's working and I'm going to tell you what's not working. And I think we're going to figure it out. And there's a lot of us that are doing it. And the super adaptive way of being is a new way of being. I'm figuring it out. I use LinkedIn, on Antis Ripping, we're on all social media. Please follow us. We're very much involved in what's called cause marketing, in being corporate stewards and how we talk about it. And I, and I talk about a lot of causes. And by the way, the reason I can do that, I'm sorry, I'm doing this. I hear myself it's like, God, shut up. <laughs> but, but it's really important to me that people understand. Yeah, my company knows why we exist and it's big, man. We are really united and knowing that we exist to keep family safe and dry. But me, I really know what fulfills me and that is awakening passion and others for social change. It's been focused in my mind. That's what I live for over the last three years. And since that time, I've never been more focused and happier. So that's why you'll see me pushing so many causes that acknowledge and lift people. Awesome. Charles, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate it. All right, man. Thanks, Kevin. We'll see you, man. Good luck. Bye. -bye. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Charles Antis and learned something about the importance of a steady voice of leadership in trying times. Please give it five stars, share it with a friend, and join me for episode four, where I talk with Zach Swire, EOS implementer and business consultant on making a better business for a better life. We'll see you then. Mm -hmm.